Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're mine. Hallelujah. It's the highest praise. Somebody shout hallelujah in this place. Come on, say hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We bring you greetings from our West Campus under the leadership of Pastor Hammond and his wife Marcia and family and to all of you, our Heavenly Father's children in this place and online, our God is great. <laughs> I know that's to be true. And he is greatly to be praised. Has God done anything for you today? Amen. I want to praise God for some good friends uh, who, who are visiting with us today, the Hatchet family. They came all the way from the woodlands to be with us today. So let's praise God for my friends here, some of the greatest people I know, uh, Brother Harold and his wife, Charlize. I remember, I'm, correct me, is this about six or seven years ago? Seven? I don't even know how I remember that. It just came to me. Seven years ago, he calls me on the phone and he says, with tears in his eyes and you know when you have a friend you know something's wrong you don't have to be in the in the room and he cried and he said I need you to pray for my wife she has cancer and they're saying that this cancer has the potential to be terminal I want you to look on the front row and tell your neighbor the devil is a liar hallelujah come on y'all I'm not talking about a toe ache I'm not talking about a COVID. I'm talking about cancer. And when I say COVID, I know it's, it's been deadly for some. I, I know I've lost people to it. But you know, it got to a point where people said COVID. It was kind of like, ah, people stopped believing in it. But you've never heard anybody say cancer. Ah, no matter what kind it is, it scares people to death. And she's a living, breathing testimony. And God is a healer. And while she's in the room, we're going to borrow that anointing and say, God, we cancel cancer in our families' lives, in our children's lives, in our parents' lives. We cancel it. Everybody watching online, everybody in this room, it's going to skip some generations. Somebody say it's going to skip a generation. We banish it back to hell where it belongs. No more. Yes, sir. No more. No more. Anybody from out of town, I was, I was over here on my left, and these uh, beautiful people, I was just standing next to them. They said, Pastor, we came all the way from Southfield, Michigan, just to see you today. Can y'all praise God for my friends from Michigan? Anybody else from out of the state in the room? Let's praise God for all of our out-of-state guests. Thank you so much. Truth is... If you live in Texas, you can still drive out of state miles. So, matter of fact, if you live anywhere other than Katy, you drove a country mile to get here. So, we thank you so much <laughs> for being here today. Where I come from, do you know that I could drive? <laughs> Where I come from, I could drive five minutes and be in another state. I'm from Gary, Indiana. I just, I mean, all they had to do is, I could be, I could be in Michigan. I could be where they lived in two hours. I could be in Chicago in 20 minutes. Here, you drive 20 minutes, you get to the grocery store. <laughs> it takes 20 minutes to get to the Galleria if it ain't no traffic. So, so it's, uh, it's definitely amazing to be here. I got a word for you today. Because let me tell you something, this is what I know for sure. This is what I know for sure, and the Lord helped me to start this message. Our ministry, even yet our generation, is under, our country is under a spiritual attack. It's manifesting in physical things. But what you're going through right now is a principality. It is a spirit of wickedness in a high place. And it manifests in marriage, it manifests in money, it manifests in children, but somebody shout it's a spirit. 
How do I know? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. My wife right now, she's so busy right now. I'm praying for her. She's got five children, all doing great stuff. You got one that, that DJs all over the world and is an international model for ball main and coach. So he's all over the place. Then you got another one that, that just got signed to play with the Lakers summer team. Then you got two more that are playing basketball at Texas Southern University. And then you got one that's 16. That's better than all of them. <laughs> this girl has been recruited by UCLA, North Carolina, every school you can think of. And she's trying to find her way on, on how, how, how am I there for the son, but don't let the daughter down. How do I, how am I there for the daughter, but don't want the son to feel like I'm not. So, so some of y'all like her, that's why she's not here today. You are spread so thin and you feel inadequate in every position because the moment you pay Peter, now you got to rob Paul. And I come to show you today some ways that you can be effective in making sure that the principality does not rob you of your joy. Anybody down for that kind of word today? I want you to open your Bibles. I want you to, let's praise God for this music ministry. Great job. Great job. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. All the bosses in the room shout at me. All right. I just want to find out who I'm talking to. Any future bosses working on it? Any boss babies? I'm just, I'm coming up on it. I'm, this word today. And I, right now it's a message. Now, if y'all push me, it might turn to a sermon. But right now it's a lesson because I promise you that I am getting ready to reveal to you what the enemy is doing behind the curtain of your life. Because it ain't always what's on the stage. There's some strings being pulled behind the curtains that I want you to understand. And this is, this is what Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. I'm going to read verse 18. Back it up just for me one verse, guys. I'm going to go to verse 18, and I want to show you a very, very, very stark comparison um, in the Scripture. And the Bible says, and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, what were they doing? Casting a net into the sea, for they were what? Fishers. Fishers. All right, verse 19. And he said unto them, this is where I want to hang my hat, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You're going to do the same thing, but in a different environment. I'm not going to change your nature. I'm just going to change your pool. Because a lot of people think that when God calls them, he calls you to be the opposite of who you are. He called you because you were a fisherman. He called you because you were a banker. He called you because you were a CPA. He called you because you had carpentry skills. Whatever it is, he called you to do that. Now he wants to take that skill set and put it in a different arena. The devil wants you to think that God was dissatisfied with who you were. God is not dissatisfied with who you were. He's just dissatisfied with where you were working. So I'm about to take you and I'm going to point you in a different direction because you're effective where you are. Now I need to give you authority. What if I told you that God is getting ready to move you from just being effective in an area to having authority over it? Do I have anybody in here? The topic ain't going to make no sense until the end, but I promise you I'm going to do my best to explain it. I want to talk on this subject for the next few moments. I want to talk about the $14 man. The $14 man. It don't make sense right now. Just, just, just trust me. Tell your neighbor, I ain't worth but $14. Just, just trust me. Trust me. Trust me. I know, you, I know you're like, huh? I, I want to talk about the $14 man. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Matter of fact, let me explain it quickly before you get lost. Um, scientists suggest that out of 118 elements on the periodic table that the human anatomy 
is comprised, 99% of our body is made out of just six elements. The other 1%, five elements for the human body, then totaling 11 elements in our body. Now, I know some of y'all are like, what are you talking about? I didn't do that well in science either. Um, but there is this thing they used to have on the wall in chemistry called the periodic table. It's confusing. It's, it's got numbers and letters. Most of us only know a couple of them. We know H. Two, and we know O, which by the way, if you split them up, you can actually say you know three because H and O ain't the same. You combine two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, and now you have water, so you actually know three elements. The rest of them, you know some, you just may not know it's an element. Did you not know that iron is an element? And that there is enough iron in your body to make a nail? Well, some of y'all always cold, maybe a thumbtack. You know, some, <laughs> any, anemic, any, any anemic people in here are always cold? It's because so your body is low on iron because iron regulates the, the body's temperature. You have, enough, you have enough iron in your body to make a nail. Think about that. Is that amazing? You, you, have, you have enough carbon in your body to make 900 pencils. You, ain't know, you didn't know that, did you? So you got enough iron in your body to make a nail, enough carbon in your body to make 900 pencils. You got enough sulfur in your body to kill all of the ticks and fleas on the dog. Now, sulfur, I'm going to tell you what sulfur is. That's that egg smelling stuff. You ever smelled it in water? So you have, you have sulfur in your enough that if the gas was released on the dog, it would kill all of the parasites on the dog. Now, if you take all of the elements that you have in your body, the iron, uh, if you take the hydrogen, the, the nitrogen, the, the calcium, the, 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 the phosphorus, if you take all of those uh, elements in your body and, and you melted them down, you could make about $14 off of your body. Because elements, brass, steel, uh, iron ore, all of this stuff is worth money. So if, if your body was turned in to elements and you went to the auction block or you went uh, to, to the scrapyard, you could sell your body's contents for about $14, give or take a dollar or two, depending on inflation and economic situations. Depending on if you're in pounds or dollars, or euros, but just about $14. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to say with, with all humility, I ain't worth but about $14. Just, just look at them. Well, ain't no, I don't know why they hating on $14. I don't know why they lying on $14. I, I don't know why they don't like and can't stand, I ain't but worth $14. So my question to you is, if you're only worth $14, then why is the devil working so hard to destroy you? That's a good question. Because $14, uh, I looked on Amazon, it covers just about all Father's Day gifts. <laughs> all Father's Day gifts fit within this $14. Not no Mama Day gift. All Father's Day gifts fits within this. You can get a Father's Day mug right now to say, I love my dad for about $13.98 on Amazon. $14, the price of one good waffle maker. $14, you can get a pack of pencils on Amazon with a couple of ink pens and a protractor for about $14. I looked it up. This is true. I want you to look at it. You can get about seven bars of soap. Irish Spring. I ain't talking about Dove now. I know y'all a little fancy in here, but I'm talking about Dial. <laughs> you, 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 $14. This is, this is the equivalent of your body and its contents is equivalent to one bar of exfoliating soap on Amazon. 
That's how inexpensive the flesh is. So then there must be something else because if I'm only worth $15 and Jesus paid the ultimate price, then there must be something else about me. Because I don't see the devil conspiring with all of hell for something that's only worth $14. I don't see Jesus Christ going to the cross and paying the ultimate price for $14 worth of iron and carbon and, and calcium. So then there must be something else about me that's important enough for Jesus to pay it all for. And I come to tell you there is another side of you that is more valuable than your flesh. And it is called your soul. That has no price tag. The soul. The Bible says that, that Jesus bent down, that God bent down into the dirt and he spit and he created man. But here it is. And he breathed into man the what? Breath of life. Listen. And then man became a living soul. Notice man had flesh and he wasn't yet living. He had iron and he wasn't living. He had calcium and he wasn't living. He had sulfur and he wasn't living. Man didn't become a living soul until God breathed into us the breath of life and then we became a living soul. And the moment you began to live and the moment you began to have a soul, then the enemy became upset with you. Why? Because according to Genesis, we were created in the image of God and in the likeness of God, which means we are the reflection of God. And Satan is upset with you is because he was once in the image of God. Be but because of his betrayal, has been cast out of heaven, and now you are in the position that Satan used to occupy. So if you have ever wondered why Satan hates you and your children and your family and your body so much, it's because you represent what he used to be. And let me tell you, the most dangerous person in your life right now is the person you are about to replace. I'm about to help somebody in here right now. Because God is about to give you a job that you don't have the qualifications for. He's about to put you in a neighborhood you ain't got the money for. He's about to give your children an opportunity that they don't have the education for. And there are spirits in the world right now that are going to conspire against you because the devil always hates next. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm next. I'm next. My family's next. My last name is next. And because God is getting ready to use you right now, everything in hell is going to do what it can to stop you from getting there. But I came to tell you the devil is a liar and no weapon formed against you will be able to prosper. Can somebody shout amen in this place? So let me tell you something. The devil, he ain't after dust. He's not after dust. You can find it anywhere. The enemy is after your soul. Somebody say he's after my soul. Jesus left heaven off of a throne in a gated community with a mansion so big that it has houses in it to walk up a dusty road up Calvary for your soul. Are you listening to me? For your soul. And people don't like salvation preaching anymore because all we want to talk about is the blessings. But let me tell you something. This old earthly tabernacle shall dissolve. You better start shouting because you got another building not made by hand. And we cannot spend our life trying to acquire more houses and more land and more clothes and more handbags and more shoes. Because when you die, the moth is going to eat them up. The rust is going to take it out. But you got a body and a soul and only what you do for Christ will last. Anybody want to praise God for soul salvation? Hallelujah to the name of God. Your soul is important. Your soul is important, so important that God gave his dust for it. Now, why did Jesus have to become man? Here it is. Genesis 11 says that seed begets after his own kind. So the reason why Jesus Christ had to become man is because a seed only begets after his own kind. So you cannot put an orange seed in the ground and get an apple. You cannot put a grape seed in the ground and get an oak tree. So the reason why Jesus had to become flesh is because only flesh could redeem flesh. So when he became flesh, 
It showed you what he was coming to redeem. He didn't become a dog reincarnated. He didn't become a cat reincarnated. He didn't become, even though we call him the lion of the tribe of Judah, he did not become a physical lion reincarnate. He became man, and man became a living soul. So now Jesus, who is spirit, has to become man and now be a living soul, which is why it's so important for you to know that even when he became man, he was still spirit. He did not have to stop being spirit to become flesh, and he never has to stop being flesh to become spirit. He was God while he was man, and he was man while he was God. He was in charge of the world, and yet he was dying on the cross. He was crying tears, and yet wiping yours away. He was spinning the world on his finger, and yet the earth was reeling and rocking like a drunken man. He's 100% God and 100% man, and yes, we speak of him in duality, but yet he is singular because there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and we do have the Trinity. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, that is true. Three, but all three make one. He never has to stop being what he was to be what he is. And he never has to stop being what he is to be what he was. Because Revelation says he is, was, and is to come. He's in the future, but yet he's still in the past while he's standing in the present because he's a very present help in the time of... And because his assignment was to redeem man, then it was the responsibility of the devil to turn people against him to try to crucify him. Because the first thing you understand once you realize you are valuable is what makes you valuable is your assignment. Oh, hear me well. You can put on $10,000 worth of clothes, you still worth $14. Oh, you better hear what I'm telling you. You, 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 can put on, you can put on Valentino right now, but you still ain't worth about $14. You, you, you can put on Off-White right now, but you still only worth $14. You are dirt. You are dirt. Listen, I say this all the time, and especially for those of us. Have you ever noticed that even though you take a bath every day, your clothes still get dirty? You know why? Because you dirt. <laughs> I, I know, I know. And I guess you say, Girl, Pastor, I'm fine. You just find dirt. <laughs> Pastor, I'm cute. You're the cutest dirt we've ever seen. If you're rich, you're rich dirt. Poor, poor dirt. We're all dirt. Check, that, check your collar later on today. It's going to tell on you. It's going to tell on you. It's going to tell on you. Men, check that collar. It's going to tell you. Every woman in here, you ain't got to jog. You ain't got to work out. You ain't got to do nothing. But every once in a while, you got to wash your hair. You know why? Because you're dirt. Even when you don't leave outside, uh, you don't even leave from inside of your house. You stay in all day, and you still got to take a bath at night. Because you are dirt. Tell your neighbor you're dirt. Arrogant, you're still dirt. <laughs> we're, just, we're just dirt created by God. The only thing that makes us or the first thing that makes us valuable is our assignment. Somebody say my assignment. I'm getting ready to preach because there are no records of the disciples' issues in the Bible until they were chosen. Y'all don't want to help me preach today. Judas was always who he was. But we ain't find out who he was until Jesus picked him. Peter, he was always crazy. You don't have a knife on you and cut a man's ear off on the weekend you having a bad day. You cut a man's ear off, you crazy from the beginning. Thomas said, I don't believe. I don't believe it's him. Okay, if it's him, I believe it if you show me the nail prints in his hand. My question for you is, do you think that Judas was the only person who ever betrayed Jesus? Do you think that Peter was the only one to ever deny him? Do you think that Thomas was the only person to ever doubt him? Absolutely not. The reason we know about Peter, the reason we know about Judas, the reason we know about Thomas is because Jesus picked him. 
And the problem that most of us don't understand is that your problems will always be magnified when you're chosen. Other people can get away with it. You will never be able to get away with it because you are anointed. You better hear me. They can come to work late and you're saying stuff. Why y'all always picking on me? Y'all don't say nothing to nobody else. They're always looking at the chosen generation. They're always looking at the picked people. Everybody else on your job is going to be able to get away with it. Why? Because they were not chosen. Slap somebody and say, I'm chosen. That's why they always hating on you. That's why they always lying on you. That's why they always looking at you funny. You are no different than anybody else except for the fact that you are chosen. The devil hates picked people. We only know that Judas was who he was because of his assignment. And you better be careful when you ask God, Lord, help me to discover my purpose because... Oh, God, I'm, I'm trying not to come down there. I'm going to stay up here. Because the moment you discover your purpose, the devil discovers you. As long as you don't know what you're doing in life, you're off his radar. As long as you want and talk about, I don't know my purpose. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm still waiting on the Lord. The devil, like, I'm waiting on him too. But the moment you wake up and realize I'm the head and not the tail, when you wake up and recognize that I am above and not beneath, when you recognize that there is a business and a company inside of you, when you recognize that you finally find out, you know what, I can work and still be depressed. I can sing my way out of it. I can praise my way out of it. Once you find out your assignment, your assignment, determines your attack. Anybody under attack right now? You know why? Because you got an assignment. The problem with most Christians is the devil believes in you more than you believe in yourself. When Jesus died on the cross, he told all of the Christians, in three days... I'm going to tear this temple down. In three days, I'm going to lift it back up. Y'all need to be there when I get up. None of the Christians other than one woman showed up. One woman named Mary, she, she came. But here's what I understand about the scripture. The Bible says that when they put him in the tomb, that the Romans had two guards standing outside. What, since when do you put a guard at a dead man's? Oh, Y'all don't want I'm going to talk to this who... If he died, why are you putting people there to guard him? Because you believed what he said. The problem is your enemies believe in you more than you believe in yourself. Over the next 30 seconds, I'm going to give you, I'm a, I believe in me. Somebody shout, I believe in me. You ain't got to believe in me. I believe in me. I don't have it all, but I believe in me. I don't know where it's coming from, but I believe in me. I don't know what God is doing, but I believe in me. I don't know what they're saying, but I believe in me. Where are all of the believers in the room and online? I dare somebody shout, I believe in me. Your value increases based on the assignment placed on your life. And whenever your assignment is assigned, so are your attacks. I'm preaching to y'all ain't said a word. You've been trying to figure out why you're going through so much hell. It's because there's an assignment on your life. Which is bringing me to the second point. Once the assignment is discovered, here comes the distractions. Oh, help me in this place. The disciples were with Jesus for 42 months. Every day he's teaching them. Be humble. Be prayerful. Be watchful. You see, he's giving them hints on how to handle an assignment. He never said be lazy. He never said get 12 hours of sleep a day. In fact, they slept so much he got mad at them and said, can, can y'all, y'all can't even stay up for, for 60 minutes? He says, I, I got an assignment for you. Uh, but, but, but the devil wants to distract that assignment. And, and, and here's the truth. God said, I picked you, and I know you had issues. 
Paul said it this way in Romans. He says, he says uh, for I know that in me that is in my flesh. Dwell, anybody, any Bible readers in here? He says, dwell of no good thing. And he says, watch this. He says, well, I, I have the desire to do good, but I can't deny myself. Anybody here want to be honest? Be like, you know what? I, I want to stop cussing people out, but when they make me mad. Let me, let me step down here because... Y'all, I, I got to get your sin before you can say amen. I, I, I want to stop drinking, but it make me just escape. Lord, I don't want to smoke all the time, but, but it makes me forget. And it's from the earth. You know that argument about weed being from the earth, so it's okay, so is oil. Go smoke that too. If God put it here for me and for you, you better take advantage, man. Take advantage. All of the things that we do to escape reality just simply means that reality is there when we come back down. It's hard to be called. It's hard to be exceptional. It's hard to have a gift on your life that you didn't ask for. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God already knew I was going to make this woman, this man special. You didn't do anything. He gives gifts without repentance. You didn't do anything for it. He chose you. And that's why I shout because he chose me. Anybody who chooses you and has options, you ought to be grateful to. He picked you. He picked you. And now here comes the distractions. Let me ask people online, those of you in the room, how many of y'all have been dealing with distractions lately? Just, just before you're getting ready to get your, your groove going and you're getting ready to get everything moving, here comes something that requires your attention that ain't even your business. Some, one lady in the back just put her hand on her head and she said, Jesus. Look at y'all trying to find out who it is. I ain't going to tell you where she at. <laughs> the disciples that followed Jesus, although they were chosen, they were still 99% iron, calcium, just dirt. He picked $14 men to turn the world upside down. Here's one thing I don't think we think about when we talk about the disciples. I know God called them, but they were human. You know, they got tired. They got hungry. They got frustrated. Peter used profanity to get his out. On one, one occasion, Scripture tells us Peter would cuss a man out, and, and they came to crucify Jesus. Peter pulled his, ear, his, his knife out and cut the man's ear off, and he still went to heaven. I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> I ain't trying to give nobody no ideas, but he still got in. That's all I'm going to tell you. He preached, <laughs> he preached Pentecost, so... Cut the man's ear off. God still picked them. They got sick. And if they didn't get sick, their, their relatives got sick. Remember when Peter's mother-in-law got sick and he had to pull Jesus off the road to go to the house and to heal her? Look at all these distractions. And I'm going to tell you something right now. A lot of y'all, distractions are the proof that you're close to destiny. <laughs> Write that down. Distractions are proof that you are close to to your destiny. Somebody shout, I'm close. I'm close. When you are being distracted, you have to understand that it is the enemy's tactic to keep you from doing the assignment to spend your energy on the distraction. All right, let me show you how you know you're being distracted. Put this in your notes. You know you're being distracted when you stop your assignment to think about your attacks. This is the enemy's tactic. Here you are doing good. You got momentum. You're getting ready to go forward. And now he has you distracted because now you're over here trying to answer and deal with this when the assignment is that. How many of y'all are being distracted right now? You started writing a book, but you stopped. You started reading the book, but you stopped. You were writing your business plan down and right on your nightstand right now. Or it was on top. Now it's inside. 
And, and now, it, it, so the, the, the top drawer got too full, so now it's in the bottom drawer. And, and when you start cleaning and you look at it and say, well, it's been three years and I haven't done it. Now it's in the garbage can. And now you have a desire to do it again, but you threw the plan away. Who am I talking to? Raise your hand. God told you to write the book, but you're so busy working nine to five. And then when you get home, you're distracted because now you're tired. You're too tired to do. So now you're working for them, but won't work for you. And just when you get enough energy, now, now that, that stored up energy that you had, now your children acting crazy. So now, now you got to go deal with that. And just when you get them together and, and you and your husband are doing good, now y'all don't like each other. So now y'all going to counseling. So now you're spending your, 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 your assignment time in therapy. Distractions. Right now I'm preaching a word that could help you with some of y'all minds somewhere else. Distractions. Hunger is a distraction. You should have ate breakfast. It ain't my fault. <laughs> Talking about, I wish you'd hurry up. Nope, my church is right on time. You had a chance to eat breakfast before you got here. You should have woke up and left home be five minutes earlier. You could have got you a toast of strudel or something. <laughs> Distractions. Watching seasons of stuff you've already seen. How many more episodes of Martin? You, you know all of them already. I'm guilty. <laughs> I just started watching Game of Thrones. I'm on season three in two days. Lord, just help me, Jesus. I'm distracted as a mug right now. It's good. Distractions. You get on social media and you start scrolling and scrolling. And scrolling. Now you're reading comments. That's a distraction. You sitting up reading comments about somebody else's life. That ain't got nothing to do with you. Up here forming an opinion. Talking about, I think he did do it. I really believe he did. You don't know them people. And once you figure out they did, what you going to do? Come on, talk to me, y'all. Reading blogs on sites, just distracted. Meanwhile, your assignment is drying up. And people are always saying they don't have enough time. Or you get the same amount of time as everybody else who's successful. It depends on how you use it. Oprah got 24 hours just like you. What are you doing with the 24 hours? I'm telling you what's happening. We are distracted. Anybody know you got distractions? Distractions, conversations with people you don't even like on the phone. Just anybody, you can sit the phone down and go do something else and come back to it and say, uh huh, you don't even need to be talking to them. <laughs> anybody, you muting because you're talking to somebody else. Hold on. Uh huh. Oh, you forgot to unmute it. You there? Uh huh. Somebody shout, I'm distracted. It happens in church. I can tell you, I look at some of y'all, we be, I'm preaching in church, but you can't resist it. Oh, I was taking notes, Reverend. No, you wasn't. <laughs> some of y'all are, I know. Distractions are the enemy to assignments. I was telling the men, uh, I got a chance to go, thank God I got a chance to go to the uh, NBA championship uh, game in Boston. And uh, Gary Payton II, who is my wife's nephew, gave us tickets. So not only did I got to go to the game in a way that I never got the chance to go, when they won the championship, I was on the court with them like, yeah, yeah. I don't know but him and Draymond. I don't know nobody else on the court, but I'm out there swinging my shirt, got my hat on. I'm in the back. They, they, they got champagne, so much champagne, you can smell it coming around the corner. They throwing champagne everywhere. Everybody's going crazy. They going nuts. They jumping into each other. Grown men having the time of their life. They skipping around, and I'm in there sweating like I just finished playing the game, and there's champagne on my hat. And I'm like, yeah, boy, ain't played one minute. <laughs> we won. Who is We. 
I got my hat on. I got my shirt on. I go on the back. They interview us. I, we taking pictures with the trophy. I ain't did nothing. After the party, there's an after party. My wife was with me, so it was a hotel lobby. <laughs> After the Bellevue, it was probably Chris. I don't know what was going on, but they were going nuts. Clay Thompson was going crazy. Draymond was going crazy. Steph was going crazy. And I looked at Lady Shawnee at 2.30 in the morning and said, I got to preach tomorrow. They said it ain't over to six. I said, yeah, it ain't over to six for them, but I don't play for the Warriors. I play for the Lighthouse, and I got to be at church in a minute. I'm trying to tell you, sometimes you got to step away from what you enjoy to get to your assignment. Sometimes you got to step away from something that's fun to get to your assignment, and it takes discipline to walk away. I know it's fun. I know it's a turn up. But listen to me, young people. That's their championship. What are you going to win at? And some of us are so busy attending other people's celebration that we never accomplish anything to be celebrated for. And so when we were walking out, the starting five was just walking in. And everybody wanted to stay. And I and her were the only people walking out of a party when everybody else was walking in. Why? Because I have an assignment. And I was not going to sit there and cheat you out of the word of God so that I can have four hours of enjoyment for something that I did not help accomplish. Sometimes your assignment means you have to walk away from fun. Sometimes your assignment means you have to walk away from things you enjoy because if you really understood what I meant your assignment always takes place in the dark the preparation for your assignment always takes place in the dark nobody studies on stage this is a result of the assignment wondering do you have the discipline To leave the atmosphere so you can get into the assignment. I left. I don't even know what I missed. See, you, you, you start figuring out when you ain't there, you won't know what you missed. I don't know what I missed. Some people are always afraid to miss. Them. I don't want to miss no fun, but how about your future? I don't want to miss the turn up. What about your assignment? No. No, I left. I left and got on the plane and came home and studied to show myself approved. And 600 men showed up, 525 men showed up, thousands online showed up. And God smiled on the meeting because I had the discipline to leave the atmosphere for more assignment. I know that don't make sense to some of y'all, but who am I talking to in here? Somebody shout distractions. Distractions. You're, you're distracted. Most of us, when we drive, we text the whole time. You look up and you're home and don't even know how you got there. Talk to me. You be. Next thing you know, you're home. How did I get here? You didn't even see the road. It's the truth now. And you think that because you're looking up often, they say on average you're missing about 10 seconds. Do you know how long that is? Distracted. Children in the room with you. I, I do this thing with my daughter. She calls it special time. Every day I have five minutes of uninterrupted time with her where I sit down and let her talk to me and say whatever she wants to say without me saying a word. You'd be surprised. Brothers, the reason why she always saying, I got something to tell you is because she feels you're always distracted. You know, I, I would encourage you all, don't go out to dinner with your spouse and be on phone, the phone the whole time you're at the table. 
Distractions. You'd be surprised how many people in your life are jealous of your distractions. You don't always have to cheat on your spouse for them not to trust you. There are other things that you can do that will make them disgruntled and disgusted with you too. And being on the phone every time you're talking to them or eating with them or walking with them. Distractions. I know y'all quiet because I'm on it. I ain't even, I, you know what? I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to stay right here, Brother Hatchet. I'm going to stay, I'm, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to stay right here. Because when I got them like this, I know I got them where I need to have them. Somebody shout, I'm distracted. Trying to keep up. Spending money I don't have to impress people who don't like me anyway. <laughs> Distracted. Trying to create my image in somebody else's image because I'm distracted. Do you know somebody wants you just the way you are? I mean, I promise you, it's somebody out there that will look at you and be like, you. So many people have walked past you because you were not you when they walked past you. Somebody shall be, be you. The anointing that's on your life will bring the assignment that God has for your life. I'm about to show you something else. The reason we get distracted is because we have an insatiable appetite to always fight battles we were not invited to. Oh, God. We love to fight unnecessary battles. We always respond. And every time I wake up, somebody on the internet that says something about me that don't make no sense. If I decided to spend my time responding to people online, I understand something they don't know I understand. That me responding to them makes other people know them. So they stay after you until you respond, and then all of your followers know they exist. I'll starve them with my silence. You have to understand that you don't have to fight every battle you're invited to. Oh, God, help me in this place today. And here's another thing. We often are fighting new battles with old anointings. Write this down for those of y'all who are taking notes. <laughs> she said, wow, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Every battle needs fresh oil. David had one anointing when he fought the lion and the bear. When he became the king of Judah, he had to get a new oil. Now, he was already anointed. When he was the king of Judah. But then we find out that he becomes the king of Israel after seven years. And the Bible says what? He is anointed again. Every battle needs a fresh anointing. What am I saying? You have to change your strategy. You have to change your circle. You have to change your insight. You have to change what you're reading. You got to get new information. You got to have new friends. You got to have a new perspective. Because, and I, I understand this is true, that you will be outdated in your assignment if you, can, if you think you can handle tomorrow the way you handled yesterday. The reason why Moses didn't get into the promised land is because he did not update his strategy. God told him to speak to the rock. He struck it. Why? Because that's what he did before. And we are distracted because we think that what got us here will get us there. And let me tell you, you're going to have to update your strategy. Somebody shout fresh oil. oil. Second Chronicles 20 and 22 says, as they began to sing and praise the Lord, set ambushes against the enemy of Amnon and Moab who were invading Judah and they were defeated. Here's the second thing. This is good. Listen to me. What has distracted the modern church is we think that praise is the answer for everything. Oh, I'm about to help you. I'm about to help you. The Bible says as, as they begin to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes. So we say like this, Jehoshaphat, if you praise God, God will confuse the enemy. That is so true. That praise does confuse the enemy. But I'm going to give you another example of a man named Jonah. 
who was in the belly of a fish. He praised too. And he praised. And he prayed. And he prayed. But the Bible says he was in there for three days and three nights. He did not get free until he combined his prayer and his praise. Because when you praise, it goes up to heaven. But when you pray, it brings heaven down to you. And the church, thank God for all of our praisers, but we need a new generation of prayer warriors. Lord Jesus, help me in this church right now and those online. Right now, I'm looking online. Maverick City Music is killing it. Have y'all seen these concerts with Kirk Franklin? It's crazy. They're averaging, according to Kirk Franklin, they're averaging 10,000 people at their worship experiences all across the nation. It is insane what's going on. You have, we haven't seen stuff like this since the days of Billy Graham and, and when Bishop Jakes was renting out uh, uh, arenas and having women there out loose. The movement is crazy. I thought, what if somebody got up and said, we're going to have a prayer meeting. And we're going to go to every city and just have a prayer meeting. And we're going to charge you $35 a ticket to come to the prayer meeting. I want all of the honest people in this room to stand up with mama and say you would pay $35 to go to a prayer meeting. <laughs> okay, sit down. Let me just leave it away. Okay, okay, okay. All right, just let me leave it right there. You get my point? Because all of them ain't telling the truth, but. And I didn't even want to say that. I was trying to leave it where it was, but. $35 to a prayer meeting? Then my question is, where were you when we had one for free? If you knew about it. See, here's the deal. Prayer is more important because when prayer is offered, it invokes the power of God, opens up the heavens, summons the angels, and gets the entire Godhead effective. Why? Because the Bible says that my house shall be called of all nations, not the house of praise and worship, but the house of prayer. And when we start praying again, not praising, when we start praying, we will send demons into pigs and they will run over the cliff. When we start praying, we will start to make sure that our schools are safe again. When we start praying, we will make sure that we effectively show a generation one of the tested battle weapons for the future. Our children know how to shout, but do they know how to pray? Your children have seen you worship, but when is the last time you went in the room and you and them got down on your knees and prayed heaven and fire down from heaven? I need somebody to shout, I'm going to be a prayer warrior. <laughs> Praise does confuse the enemy, but prayer changes things. Have you ever noticed that you did a lot of praising and you got home and the stuff was the same? Because you got to learn to pray. And the devil has us distracted because we always shouting. But we got to get down on our knees. Who will be honest and say sometimes you forget to pray? Come on, y'all, be honest. I'm, 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 I told you, I'm showing you what's working behind the scenes. You'll be praying, and the next thing you know is tomorrow. God, thank you for today. And yesterday. <laughs> Knick-knack, paddywhack. And, and before you know it, it's tomorrow. Anybody ever fell asleep praying? That's some good sleep, ain't it? That prayer sleep is tough. <laughs> Denzel Washington says that he always puts his house shoes underneath his bed so he can't get out of bed without getting on his knees. You got to find something. If it ain't nothing but, Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning.
starting me out on my way. Thank you for giving me a reasonable portion of health and strength. You had to find, the Bible says, man should always pray and never cease. I thank him all day long. And all prayers don't have to, let me educate you, got six minutes. All prayers don't have to sound like, you know, like you are a, a, a preacher. Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who rules and super rules our world. The God who tacked down the grass with dandelions and daffodils. The God who painted the sky with blue ether and put clouds in the sky like tacks to keep it in order. The God who allows the water to flow. The streams to bubble you. This, this God of ours. This great God that you are. The presbyteros of the God. He don't need all of that. How, 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 do, how many of y'all know he don't need all of that? Because I remember when Peter was sinking on the water, he didn't say nothing but help. Save me. All I'm saying is you got to start talking to him. I don't know what you got to say, but just say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help. I know if you withdraw yourself from me, what? Pray. Somebody touch your name and say, I pray for you. You pray for me. See, these are the kind of sermons the devil don't want you to hear. Because he wants us in sensationalism and always shouting and jumping around. How many of you know when you're shouting, you're missing half of it? I'm teaching you right now. Everybody say pray. pray. Praise is a marvelous thing, but it can distract you from praying, which is the powerful thing. You got to learn to pray. Not ask people to pray for you. You got to pray for yourself. Matter of fact, I don't ask people to pray for me. I ask people to pray with me because I'm praying for me. Pray. Everybody say pray. You have to stop fighting unassigned battles. Every fight ain't your fight. And everybody who fighting you, you don't have to fight back. Any fighters in here, it's kind of hard to hear what I'm saying right now because your mama taught you if somebody hits you. Oh, all the fighters make some noise in here. Let me see. We don't. What am I going to do with y'all? It's just something, be honest, like it's just something. Somebody come at you, it's just like. Because <sighs> you ain't coming for them. Why they coming for you? Right? And so. So because of your life and your trauma and, and, and the way you, you've handled life, all you know, all your life. You have to fight your brother. You have to fight your sister. You never thought you'd be fighting in your own house. We're fighting in the courts right now. Come on, y'all. I ain't even going to mention that because they'll use that as a sound bite and say I said something I didn't say. <laughs> but we're fighting in the court system. Women, you fighting on the job for equal pay. Men, you fighting on the job for respect. African Americans fighting to stay alive in cars and on streets. Fight. Everywhere you go, you got to fight. Fight to get a raise. Fight to keep your job. Fight to be respected. Fight, fight, fight. And if you're not fighting, you're flighting. Because the remaining people who don't like to fight, they like to run. Fighting. You have too many fights to be fighting fights that ain't your fight. You remember when the disciples were <laughs> at the, with the woman who broke the alabaster box on Jesus? Bible says, listen to this, that she broke her bottle, her business, that she'd been saving. She broke it for Jesus. And the disciples said, uh, sister, uh, you could have used that oil for another purpose. I wish I was her. I'd be like, why are you in my business? This is my oil. I can do what I want to do with my oil. But how many of y'all, like the disciples, always got your nose in somebody else's business? 
worrying about what they're doing with their oil. Jesus said, look, let me tell you something, you little nosy disciples. Jesus said, the poor you will have with you always. What he was basically saying is, how in the world am I in the room and you focused on her? How have you been in church for the last hour and a half focused on anything else other than him? Because we're easily distracted. Fighting unassigned battles, not getting rewards with our name on them. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, why are you worried about her? She can do what she wants to do with her oil. But they were fighting an unassigned battle. If I could get you to stop spending your energy on everything that calls your name. If I can get you to understand you do not have to answer your phone every time it rings. If I can get you to understand that if somebody sends you a text message and you are doing something important, they can wait the same way they make you wait. But we are so wired to be distracted. Forget to realize that the distraction is showing us how valuable we are. Dogs don't bark at parked cars. The enemy is coming after you because you are valuable. And the least you could do is not be distracted. Who am I talking to right now? I want you to think about this, and I'm finished. I want you to think about this. How much further would you be in life if you were focused? Where would you be if you were looking at your assignment and not an algorithm? If you equal all the words you read on social media this week, you could have finished a book. The clickbait is so real these days, they got you swiping only to fool you at the end. Swiping, scrolling, liking, reading. And the people you're reading about are the people who are not distracted. The people whose lives you worried about how many times J-Lo getting married and you still praying for your first husband. And here you are making up opinions about somebody you never met. So what? It ain't your business. And, and listen, I'm in your face because this young generation, if y'all don't figure it out, if y'all don't figure out that everybody's business ain't your business. If y'all don't figure out that, that having a lot of TikTok followers don't make you famous. If you don't find out how to do something else other than try to be an influencer. Somebody shout, there's more. Distracted. The distraction is so real, they got grown people acting like children. You got 60-year-olds trying to go viral. Y'all would laugh all you want. I'm here in your face, and I'm serious as a man with bone cancer. You're acting like you're worth $14. Instead of acting like you're the real person that he came from heaven to earth to save, you're more valuable than the output you've been given. Don't let the devil figure out that you're more valuable than you know about yourself. I need every person in the room and online who will truthfully say, I've undervalued myself. 
I want you to stand on your feet. I, I, haven't, I haven't treated myself like I was worth more than $14. We go after the things of the flesh, but God came after the spirit. Somebody say me if you would, if I'm talking to you, you, you would be further if you would focus. You'd have more money if you were focused. You'd be healthier if you were focused. You wouldn't be so depressed if you were focused. You'd be further ahead if you weren't trying to keep up. I remember waking up, preaching this sermon to myself. And like you, I wasn't excited to hear it either. But it was the day that my life changed forever when I realized that I was distracted. I remember, Brother Harold, I sent Bishop T.D. Jakes five of my sermons. He said, when I first met him, he said, send me five of your sermons. I want to hear you preach. I hope what I say to you right now isn't offensive. And if it is, I want you to know right now, I do not apologize. Okay, I want to, I'm going to repeat it because I don't want you to think I made a mistake. What I said. I hope that I don't offend you with what I'm getting ready to say. But if I do offend you, I want you to know I do not, I don't apologize. Are you ready? He listened to my five sermons. And he said, uh, I was 28. He said, I don't, I don't have time to listen to this. Not because you're not good, because it isn't. He said, you are an Olympic swimmer, but the problem is you only like shallow water. You are an Olympic swimmer, but your problem is you only have an appetite for the baby pool. And until you have the courage to jump in deep waters, we will never know how good you are. Until you have the courage to stretch out and do what nobody else can do, we'll always see you walk in water but never on it. And your children are waiting on you to be the first person in your family to make sure that they don't have to pay your debt when you die. And your children are waiting on you to do what other nationalities do, and that is for them to have something to start with when they get started. And listen to me, African-American people especially, we're always talking about being marginalized, but let me tell you, if we shopped less, and bought less depreciating assets, we could give our children a head start. That means that you gotta have less now so they can have more later. See, we grew up, us 80 babies, we grew up with mamas, not all of us, but some of us, we grew up with mamas who wear the same clothes to make sure we had different clothes. I tell you, when I go to the store and I see these babies walking in Walmart with diapers on and no clothes and the mama got a Birkin bag on her arm and a Louis Vuitton bag on her shoulder, it shows me we're distracted. Oh, right, I know I'm hurting your feelings, but I'm in here now. We out here, so we might as well keep going. We're distracted. Our rent costs half our monthly income. The car costs the rest, and then we're at the church asking for benevolence. Very simple formula. Your rent or mortgage should not cost you more than 25% of your monthly income. That means you should be able to pay your rent with one check. You should not have to wait until you get paid to pay for where you live. Pastor, the neighborhood ain't safe. I grew up in Gary. You can live in unsafe neighborhoods. I don't want to raise my kid in that environment. It's not, don't raise them in the streets. Create an environment in the house. 
until you can get the job and get undistracted and build the business that God has put inside of you. Who, who gonna hear me? Who gonna hear me? Come on, who gonna hear me? I, I know who's not gonna be mad. Who's gonna say, you know what, he's talking to me, but, but I'm worth more than the 14. I got a soul that God came to save and I've got a vision and an assignment. If you want me to pray for you to break that curse on your life, I want you to come to this altar right now. I broke it on mine. I can break it on yours. If I'm talking to you, come to this altar. If you're not ashamed, if, you're not gonna, if you don't want to leave here and act like you got it all together. Come on and praise God for those who are coming. The Lord showed me a long time ago. He showed me a long time ago that you can do anything, listen, that you do. If you don't do it, if you don't work it, it won't work. The person beside you, the person behind you, the person in front of you, every one of you was given an assignment. Every one of you was given an assignment. Somebody say assignment. assignment. Say it again, assignment. assignment. Number two, don't be distracted. Say, God, help me with the distractions. Help me with the distractions. I don't have to keep up with the Joneses. I got what I got. He gave it to me. I look how I look. That's how he made me. I want you to be proud. Listen, you need to be happy with just how you look. Just look in the mirror and say, he made me this way, so it must be okay. <laughs> Pastor, where are you getting this from? Experience. I remember hating the sight of myself. When I was in high school, I was 6'5", but I was only 100 and... 80 pounds. All the guys were strong. I was thin. I was taking creatine, eating steaks and potatoes. I was shorter than everybody else, so I used to go to the weight room, listen to me, and connect my ankles to a bar because they told me if I hung upside down, I would stretch. Didn't like nothing about myself. Then when I was in college, I turned 20 years old and my hairline started to disappear. So now here I am, losing my hair with guys who was wearing do-rags and had waves. They were seasick. And playing basketball in D Division I and the camera's on you, I could score 20, 24 points in the game. All I could do is look at the top of my head. Insecure. Let me give you my testimony so that you'll feel better when I pray for you. And then we would go, and everybody's daddy would be in the, in the stands cheering. Not mine. He was five blocks, five blocks up the street, but not at the game. Oh, watch this. Me and my daddy lived on the same street growing up. And he never once entered the home I lived in. So now I got that. Oh, and now my mom, she didn't have no money. She worked at Taco Bell and then later on at a chili cheese factory called Zales. My mother made chili cheese hamburgers and hot dogs to feed us when we were growing up. And that was our dinner every night because she couldn't even afford to buy the food from the restaurant she worked at. So what she would do is work the night shift so she could take us the food that they were going to throw away. Oh, by the way, that means we were at home all night by ourselves. Which means she was asleep when we woke up to go to school in the morning. So I never remember her saying, have a good day. Wasn't no Lunchable packed. You understand what I'm telling you? On my basketball team, three of my teammates were shot in the head. 
The first friend I ever had to die in my life was in the sixth grade. He got shot in the head when we were 12. 12. And for months in our neighborhood, I will walk past where he was shot and see the blood stain in the concrete. By the way, the next week, when they found out who killed him, they killed him. He was 14. He was in our school too. And yet, I'm standing on this stage talking to you about what God can do if you will be focused, undistracted, and unmoved by the wiles of the devil. You have to have the strength to be successful. And you have to have the courage to stand when you get it because when the Lord gives it to you, the devil's going to try to take it away. And I got you at this altar today. Some of you all have tears in your eyes. The rest of you all are afraid because when you leave here today, you know it's go time. Some of you all are encouraged because you're ready to fight the devil back. Whatever emotion you have inside of you right now, I want you to remember it and don't let any conversation after this altar call take it away. The last thing I want you to do for me today is ride home in silence. Don't take a phone call that's going to take this oil away. If somebody in the car is talking, tell them, be quiet. I'm thinking of a master plan that's going to get us all out of this situation. Somebody say, I may be a $14 man, but my soul is priceless. And I want you to tap into the same part of you that Jesus redeemed. I want you to tap into the same part of you that he left heaven to save. Lift your hands. Let's worship in this place. Lift your hands in this place. Open up your mouth and begin to speak to God. Come on, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. All of my worship. Come on, God, do it in this place. I will always worship you. Worship you. As long as I'm breathing. God, we break every curse. You will always worship you. Come on, everybody, lift up your voice and sing it together. I will not be silent.
is my worship. All of my Somebody say, I'm unstoppable. I'm unstoppable. Not because of me, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody shout, I'm unstoppable. Somebody say, I'm brave. I'm courageous. I'm powerful. I'm brilliant. I'm smart. You have to speak well to yourself. You got to believe it. And I tell you, God don't make junk. And he don't make mistakes. Even if your parents made an accident, God did it on purpose. <laughs> oh, no. Do you know how many people trying to have babies and can't have one? You are here on purpose. You're on purpose. Now you got to find your purpose. God, in the name of Jesus, if the anointing falls down from Aaron's beard, I pray that the anointing on this ministry and on my life finds its way to the heads of these people who are in this room and those online. God, we come up against can't. We come up against won't. We come, we come up against will not. And we stand on the word of God that says we can do all things through Christ that gives us the strength. So now God, strengthen us for the journey. Give us the power to climb walls, knock walls down, break shackles, break strongholds, break curses to deal with witches and warlocks. Keep a hedge of protection around us. Somebody's got their child at the altar, oh Lord. Maybe not physically, but they're holding their baby in their heart. They're praying that the anointing on their house finds their Cain and their Abel. Touch somebody's Jacob and Esau. Somebody's Rachel. Somebody's Elizabeth. Somebody's Mary. Somebody's Isaac. Somebody's David. Do it in the name of Jesus. And when we walk out of this place today, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let us know when we walk out of here today that the devil is defeated and God is exalted. In the name of Jesus, let everything that has breath begin to praise the Lord. I said let everything that has breath begin to praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath begin to praise the Lord. Come on, Lighthouse. Give them glory. Give them glory. Give them glory. Give them glory. Somebody give him glory. I said, somebody give him glory. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, he's worthy to be praised. I can't hear nobody. I said, shout until the roof shakes. Shout until strongholds are broken. Shout until curses are broken. If you believe it, yeah, yeah. shout yes! Yeah. Oh, I can't hear you. This is the after party. This is when we let the devil know that you should have killed us when you had the chance. 
This is when we let the devil know that we got our courage back. This is when we let the devil know that all things are about to work together for the good of them that love the Lord. Stop somebody and say, good is coming, good is coming, good is coming, good is coming. You shall inherit the spoils of the land. Good is coming, good is coming. Good. Somebody shout, greater, greater. Somebody shout greater. greater. Look at your neighbor in their eye and say, neighbor, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Look at somebody else in the face and shout, neighbor, God told me to tell you that in the future, things are brighter. All you got to do is put on the garment of praise. I'm trying to let y'all go. For the spirit of heaviness, in the next three seconds, shout until the devil knows that I believe, I believe. that I can fly. Shout. Give your neighbor one more high five and shout, neighbor, neighbor, God told me to tell you everything is going to be all right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got the wrong neighbor. Look at somebody else. Find you somebody else who believes. Look them in the eye and say, neighbor, everything is going to be all right. Be all right. If you believe it, shout it out! Shout it out! Shout it out! The devil should have took you out a long time ago. He should have never let us get to this altar. He should have never let us find out that we can do it. He should have never, he should have got us a long time ago. Somebody believe it! Do me a favor, shout the storm is over. I felt that. I felt that. I felt that. The storm is over. It's over, it's 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 over. Yeah, yeah. but I see sickness leaving the room. I don't know if y'all can see it, but I see debt leaving the room. I don't know if y'all can see it, but I see depression leaving the room. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, when I move, you move just like that. If I clap my hands, you clap your hands just like that. If I jump, you jump just like that. If I run, you run just like that. If I shout, you shout. Leave y'all alone. But 
the devil has messed around and lost another battle. Shout it out. Nobody got time to be playing with the devil. You got too much to do. Too far to go. Too big of an assignment to be living beneath your privilege. People half as smart as you, twice as far as you. Why? Because you're distracted. Lift your head up. Square your shoulders. Lift up your countenance. Stop walking in that office with your head down low. I don't care if you're the janitor. You're as valuable as the CEO. You better know who you are. I don't feel no waste time. We're going home. I've come too far from where I started, started from. Uh, um, um. Nobody told me that the road would be there. Tell somebody I don't believe he brought me this far. <laughs> I got it. Can we say it one more time and I'm going to let you go? Let's sing it together. I don't feel no way I've come too far Come too far from where I started from No, no, nobody told me Nobody told me The road This is from this place, but never from your presence. You called us off of our boats to be fishers of men. And that assignment has increased our attack. And we're not perfect, and we've made mistakes. But your grace abounds. Allow us to get home and find everything in order. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hug somebody over there. Tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Don't believe he's brought me this. Far. I'm going to say it one more time. Say it. I, I, I know.
amazing time we had in the service today. The word was phenomenal. Listen, if you haven't had an opportunity to join our church, the information is on the screen. We want to connect with you. Or maybe you're saying, hey, I just want to sow a seed into what they're doing right there at the Lighthouse Church. Well, listen, the information is also down on the screen. We want to help you connect to a greater mission. Listen, I want to pray with you because the word today, I know it's settled in someone's spirit. It's changing your life. So come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you just for everything that was said today. God, we thank you, Lord, for all the ears and the hearts that received this word because we know that you're channeling them and transferring them and pushing them into a new dimension in you. God, we just want to ask, God, that you lift them up. Whatever the issue is in life, we pray, God, that you deal with it and work it out right now. God, we just want to say thank you. All these blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we can't wait to connect with you. Remember, share this message. Share this on, on every platform you have. Someone needs to hear this word. We love you. Can't wait to see you again. Bye-bye. What's going on, family? If you're watching this video, you've already decided that you feel my vibe. You already have decided that you like something about the Lighthouse Church. And guess what? We are looking for people to minister to who look just like you, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe he is the sustainer and creator of the world. And we use this social media internet platform to spread the gospel all across the world. And that includes coming directly into your house. Lighthouse 2.0 is simply a group of people who say, you know what? We either can't make it to the sanctuary or we don't live in the city, but we love the ministry that is coming out of that house. And guess what? We view you as one of our own. So I want you to tag, text, or tweet anybody you know that needs to hear a word from God. Share this thing so that way we can actually be in line with the Great Commission. Going ye therefore into all the world, teaching people about Jesus Christ. Lighthouse 2.0. That means that you are a part of our family and you are friends that we have never met, but soon hope we can. Oh, and by the way, can I tell you what I tell all of the people who stand in line? Give me 1% of your trust. I'll earn the other 99. Give me one year of your life and God will change it. God bless you, Lighthouse 2.